Welcome back to the Warbird Mistress, and thank you for joining me yet again as we continue the series Luftwaffe at Sea. Now, we've covered the Luftwaffe's first forays into maritime aviation, their time in Spain, the addition of new inventory in the early years of the war, and now we move into the first half of the war's activities at sea and how the Luftwaffe trained, deployed, and utilized maritime aviation assets in those first years. So relax, grab a drink of whatever tickles your fancy, Lie back and join me for Opening Moves, Part 2. Now, we're not totally done with discussing the Luftwaffe's inventory. But in this particular segment, we're only going to mention inventory unique to certain units, and not those that were assigned to general maritime duties, for the most part. Instead, we're beginning with a really in-depth discussion of the types of units that were active and how the Luftwaffe was organized to meet the Reich's maritime needs, as best as they wanted to, I guess you could say. Uh, but first, we are going to have a brief discussion of early maritime operations involving the Luftwaffe, and it's not a happy trip. So our first stop is at the awkward junction of three-dimensional operations. That is, those that involve the Unterseebootwaffe, the Luftwaffe, and the surface assets of the Kriegsmarine. In this regard, there were occasional successes despite the lack of cooperation between the upper echelons of the services. Now, that's not to say that the Luftwaffe and Kriegsmarine worked closely to destroy convoys or warships, but rather that when units collaborated, success was more likely, and the opportunity to collaborate was not avoided despite the organizational silo effect being firmly in place by 1940. This was especially so in the early years of the war, when the Uberwaffe's assets were often limited to the Type 2, the so-called Einbaum, and the early Type 7 boats. So you're only looking at North Sea and coastal activities. The Luftwaffe's flying boats and float planes were more likely to be seen delivering mail, emergency supplies, medical aid, and things of that sort to the U-boats in operation there uh, during that time than they were seen later in the war. After the fall of Norway, Denmark, the Low Countries, and France, uh, support operations included reporting convoys and warships, as we discussed previously, especially in the sections on the Falkenwolf Condor and the Blomondvoss flying boats. But really, in the beginning of the war, you did see a lot more uh, interforce collaboration. However, the repercussions of denying the Kriegsmarine an independent Marineflieger service and the increasing logistical and communications distance between services would manifest in spectacular failures. Uh, most prominently of those would be Unternehmen Wikinger, which, or uh, Undertaking Viking, which was during the February of 1940. Indeed, something was quite rotten west of Denmark in the North Sea's Dogger Bank, then that runs between England and Denmark. It's an area where the depth is raised by a sandbank and popular for fishing because that's where the fish are. So Bermuda Triangle meet the dairy product lozenge. It's a lot less mysterious, but just as deadly in this case. Now, Germany sought to relieve Britain's fishing fleet of the freedom of these waters, and the Luftwaffe in Kriegsmarine endeavored to make a demonstration of force by striking out against those vessels. Now, this stood to be a tremendous propaganda victory as well, since it would have shown the British public that the RAF and the Royal Navy were unable to protect the men who went out every day, not only to earn their daily bread, but to help feed the island nation. Furthermore, it would establish German dominance in the North Sea and discourage any plans to interfere with the coming invasions of Scandinavia, the Low Countries, and France. So at this time, remember, Hitler was still of the mindset that peace between Britain and Germany was a natural end towards which both nations should work. If only Britain could be cowed out of her folly of supporting the cheese-eating surrender monkeys and their magical Maginot line of military mayhem. So the undertaking was to involve six 1934-class Z boats of the Erzotzerschlüsselflotilla, and they were led by forgotten Kapitän Fritz Berger and came out of Wilhelmshaven. He would lead his task force out to the West Wall at sea, which was what they called their intense minefields, and into the huge mess of even more minefields that the Luftwaffe and Kriegsmarine had put out in the North Sea, like so many fishing bobbers waiting for a bite. To keep the RAF and the Armée de l'Air off their backs, the Luftwaffe would provide fighter cover with BF-109s and BF-110s. That was the plan. So the destroyers all set out on their mission to scratch Scuffy the tugboat, and all was well with the world. Except it wasn't. 
As the destroyers came out of the channel between their dense minefields off the German coast, they could see no air cover. Now, that did not mean that the Luftwaffe was asleep at the wheel. Quite the opposite, in fact. She was acting like a rambunctious road rager with a substance abuse problem, getting out their morning snorted yay from a dealer having a wholesale clearance sale. They were excited. See, nobody had told the Saint of Fliegerkor what was going on. And she was an eager beaver to go out and catch her some of that sweet, sweet British shipping. The bad weather and other circumstances had kept them from having a strike in a couple of days, maybe a week, if I remember correctly. And so they really went out searching for anything. And at the heart of the error that you can all see coming, of course, lies the fact that there was no British shipping to be found. The Dogger Banks were bereft of both civilian and military shipping at that time, or at least British military shipping at that time. All that was out there was a few hundred mines that had been laid by some of the very destroyers now maneuvering amidst them. Now, that did not mean that there would be no action in the North Sea. The Heinkel 111 spotted the ships, twice, and circled just to make sure that they were British destroyers out cruising for a bruising. The destroyers expected BF-110s or BF-109s, and not these uniquely German aircraft with everything about them screaming Heinkel 111. So the crews promptly sounded the alarm and locked and loaded for a fight with what they took to be British reconnaissance, somehow. Now making two passes, the Heinkel's bombs fell on the destroyer Lebrecht Maas and split her in two. As the awkwardly victorious pilots headed for home, the destroyer Max Scholz struck a mine, a German mine, in the course of the rescue efforts, and she sunk in minutes. So with an explosion from the sea and totally empty skies, this was a clear message to the Kriegsmarine seamen that they were well, under air attack once more somehow, and when there's submarines too that they have to now fight. So torpedoes were sent into the water, flak sent skyward, machine guns firing, death charges launched. It was chaos. Every boomstick around just went boom. The destroyer Theodor Rieden would be struck by her own death charges and lose her steering until her rudder could be repaired. Meanwhile, the HE-111s are flying back home thinking that they just struck a blow at the British destroyer fleet. So after half an hour of tail chasing, the destroyers were ordered back to Wilhelmshaven. They had lost two destroyers. The Max Schultz sunk with all hands. The Leibreich Maas lost all but 60 men. The Theodor Riedel would need repairs. 578 German sailors lost their lives in the battle against nobody. Not a single British asset was within a whale's cry of the whole affair. Upon return to base, the flotilla told all about their encounter with two waves of enemy bombers, a submarine attack, and intense action at sea. And the Kriegsmarine had decided that the flotilla had simply run into a German minefield. The Tainte Fliegel Corps claimed victory for about five minutes, before being told to shut up once they realized that the action had been located right where the destroyers were. So the investigation concluded that a failure to communicate had been at the heart of the matter and that inter-service collaboration needed to be improved. Of course, this was taken to heart. Uh, of course it wasn't. Goehling somehow blamed the Kriegsmarine for being in the way of his bombs, and the Kriegsmarine, somewhat correctly, blamed the Luftwaffe for all that death and destruction stuff. And it set the pace for the rest of the war to come in many ways. Nobody was found responsible for any malfeasance, and it was all chalked up to be a simple accident. A simple, deadly accident. So now that the nasty bits are done, let's go into the stuff everyone loves. Organizational management and resource allocation. yippee ki -yay, nerd arenas. Of course, I did a whole video on the love affair between branches. The one man walking opioid epidemic and his contempt for semen was well known. So go check that out if you haven't. Uh, this is about what did happen and what there was at play during the war in terms of aviation units dedicated to maritime purposes. So let's get into the fun stuff, administration. Now the basic types of Fliegergruppen were going to be your Bordfliegergruppen, your Küstenfliegergruppen, Minensuchgruppen, the Aufklärungsgruppen, and Trägergruppen. There are others, but these were the basic frontline maritime air groups. So we'll start with the Bordfliegergruppen, the onboard aircraft groups, or, well, group. There was one umbrella group for all these aircraft, and that was Bordfliegergruppe 196. 
So the activities of this group were fairly basic and shared with basically any other nation that had catapult aircraft aboard warships. Post reconnaissance, liaison and ship to shore duties, gunnery spotting, screening for enemy forces, uh, anti-sub activity, and being catapulted off a deck like so many circus midgets and so many cannons. So they were equipped with the Hunkel 60 at first. I believe that I actually had a picture of that in for the thumbnail on the video of the early years in Spain. Uh, although the Arado uh, 196 was available in sufficient numbers to outfit the entire Kriegsmahina surface fleet by the outbreak of war. Some AG-60s were still in service until 1942, but they weren't really the predominant aircraft at all. They were kind of a reserve just-in-case aircraft. And as far as I know, they were only on auxiliary cruisers and what few merchant vessels had catapults. The next up, we get to the Kristenfliegergruppen. And while the name may indicate that they are merely coastal units, it's better to think of that as a reference to where they were stationed rather than where they were operated. Uh, these littoral flying clubs were operational well into the North Sea and Atlantic, but their name reflects is that they were land-based units situated in coastal areas and designated for operations at sea. So they were responsible for anti-shipping strikes using bombs and torpedoes, mine laying, carrying out reconnaissance and patrol duties, and acting as patrol and scope bombers. And they used a wide variety of aircraft both float planes and land planes. Uh, they included, but were not limited to, uh, Dornier 17s, 18s, and 26s, Heinkel 59s, 60s, 111s, 114s, and 115s, Junkers 88s, and Blumenfoss 138s. The majority of their operational activities, however, would be carried out in Heinkel 115s, Heinkel 111s, and Junkers 88s. Like the board Fliegergruppe, minesweepers also fell into an umbrella group, and they're a unique one, so we'll get into them now. Now, Minenzufgruppe 1 was the general command for all mine sweeping aircraft, and it was tasked with the detection and destruction of mines at sea, not mine laying, hence why they are the mine search group. Mine laying was a job for the Kustenfliegergruppen and, of course, U-boats. Now, this unit began as the Sonderkommando Mausi when it was founded in September 1940, uh, their emblem was a stylized swift eagle plucking a mine. They became Minensuchgruppe 1 in October 1942, with only a slightly different unit emblem to carry on their heritage. Now, that isn't to say that they all operated in one place at one time. The unit actually operated with six independent Staffen with administrative duties lodged in the group command and operational activities being determined by local need. Except for the Bordflikergruppe, this is probably the closest you get to real inter-service collaboration, especially with the Army needing river crossings or operations in the Baltic, in the Mediterranean, the Navy needing mine clearance duties outside of what the minesweepers could perform. You know, this really is about the tightest you get for that. So they operated aircraft uh, fitted, of course, with electromagnetic rings, which would trigger the detonation of magnetic mines. And while the impact of these rings on maneuverability was less than what one would imagine, the rings did make the aircraft even more vulnerable to interception, and many were lost. Of course, these only worked with magnetic mines. Where contact mines had to be detonated, someone had to go reach out and touch someone, and that's Ma Bell's job or the job of an unlucky ship or a lucky rifleman in these cases. However, magnetic mines were becoming the reliable norm, but I still wouldn't recommend recreational mine seeking. So we've already discussed how the Dornier 23 and the Blomontfoss aircraft kind of had these awkward magnetic rings or even just struts in the case of some of the uh, Blomontfoss aircraft that, that were you know, magnet magnetized for these duties and in the early years of the war, there was a mix of platforms used by the minesweepers. With you had the Dornier 23 uh, MS, you had the BV 138 MS, and the U 52 MSs. These were really at the heart of the infantry until 1942. After 1942, the U 52 MS was the only platform used. Some other aircraft were fitted with uh, these degaussing rings from time to time, and we'll get to those mostly, in, but in the last episode since we're going chronologically. Now, the Luftwaffe had Fernaufklärungsgruppen, Nachaufklärungsgruppen, 
regular Aufklärungsgruppen and even Panzeraufklärungsgruppen. And at sea, there were the Sea Aufklärungsgruppen, in addition to the uh, Fernaufklärungsgruppen Se and some other specialized units. But these are the reconnaissance units. Uh, they were outfitted with Heinkel 60s, Arado 95s, Arado 196s, Henschel 126s, uh, Blomenfoss 138s, and 222s as well as other float planes and flying boats, and their job was, of course, reconnaissance. But they also carried out transport, liaison, and maritime operations support, and every now and then the bombing of the things that they found. But mostly they were just busy being the eyes of the Luftwaffe at sea, just as their counterpart units were on land. So an odd, Now, an odd addition here that you may have noticed is the use of the Henschel 126. Uh, she was used by the Aufklärungsgruppe 127, and this was a unit based out of Latvia and Estonia. So, of course, the 126 did get most of its service on the Eastern Front, and here is no exception. The aircraft was used in the spring to autumn of 1943, before the unit was redesignated the Nachschlaggruppe 11, Estnisch, or Estonian, uh, which is certainly among the oddball unit histories, especially in a maritime unit. And one might only imagine what they were expected to do if you know they ever ran into a Soviet warship, but... In terms of watching the coast for small vessels, carrying out liaison duties, and generally making sure that no one was sneaking up on anyone, it did the job that it was determined to do. Even if it is kind of the last plane of which one would think when asked to list maritime aircraft, it, to me it's almost like having an entire unit of Lysanders tasked with patrolling the uh, English Channel. But you know, G Germany definitely knew how to improvise, adapt, and overcome when it had to. So next, we have the carrier air groups. All right, okay. I may have done this already. You know where to go for the info on these things. But and now we see the life rune, and that means it's time for the Seenotdienst, the Air Sea Rescue Service. Now the Luftwaffe boasted both Seenotflottinen uh, and Seenotstaffen, each of which was assigned a specific area of operations. And I'll go over those in a minute. Now, they were first equipped with Heinkel 59s, and they would follow up on reports of downed aircraft, and sometimes ships, uh, promptly and with specialized equipment. Of 142 Heinkel 59s, for example, 14 were modified with medical equipment, hoist, a uh, ladder that was fitted in the deck, uh, rescue equipment, signal flares, heated sleeping bags uh, for hypothermia, of course. All of this was made so that they were the perfect rescue aircraft. Now, especially an extra ladder. You think about having to lift somebody up into a float plane. And in the cold waters of the North Sea and the Arctic Ocean, these were essential in preventing the loss of life. Now, in addition to life-saving, it was also resource-saving. Those shot down over England were definitely going to be captured by the Allies, and that was a lost human resource, and a limited resource at that. Those downed over water, however, stood a good chance of facing down the enemy once again, thanks to the Zenodienst. Now, Heinkel 115s, as we showed in the last video, were also equipped with life-saving equipment. Uh, the standard flight inventory included rations, blankets, first aid equipment, and rafts, not only for the use of the crew, but also to be used in the event that one spotted a downed comrade. Specialized Heinkel 115s carried even more equipment and were outfitted appropriately. And I know a lot of people were asking me about this, and now's the time to get it. So, come on, buoys. The uh, and I'm already sorry for that pun. The Zedontis did famously make use of life saving buoys, uh, employed almost exclusively in the Channel and some parts of the North Sea. They were essential to saving the lives of those forced to ditch in these contested waters. Zedontis pilots and motorboat crews would be notified by radio of the men inside, their condition, their needs, uh, while the men themselves rested in a secure, warm, dry camp with bunks, blankets, rations, and all else they would need until the time they were rescued. The Allies largely left them alone, uh, even as the Zenodienst itself unfortunately became considered a target by the RAF, thanks to allegations of the Germans using aircraft marked with Red Crosses for combat duties. Now, I'm not going to get into that now, but uh, some men unfortunately may have found themselves rescued promptly by an RAF motorboat, but at least they were saved. 
Um, Allied crewmen even found the buoys handy in a few rare occasions, famously immortalized in the film One of Our Aircraft is Missing. But with the end of the Battle of Britain and, uh, you know, the Baby Blitz, the buoys were really no longer useful, and uh, they became consigned to the footnotes of history. But they're definitely one of the more interesting parts of the war on the waves, as, as far as I'm concerned. Now, there were to be a total of 10 Zanotstaffen over the course of the war. Uh, the Asta Zanotstaffen was certainly the most active unit and the most emblematic of the Luftwaffe's activities over the course of the war. Now, they began their career on the 1st of June, 1939, and they were established on Nordany in the East Frisian Islands, and on List on Suds in the North Frisian Islands. So at the outbreak of the war and the most recent surrender of France at the time, they were disbanded in June 1940 and reformed in Brest that same month as Zenotflugkommando 1, with a detachment at Gautin, further south. Now in November, they became once again Zenotstaffel 1, and they remained thus named and stationed until July 1944. Uh, then having moved to Pilal, they remained there for another month, uh, when in August of 44 they were renamed Zenotstaffel 60 until the war's end. Uh, they were equipped with a mix of aircraft. Interestingly, this included the captured French uh, Plague 521 and Germany's own Dornier 24, Fiesler 156, Heinkel 59, Heinkel 60, and Clem 35. Now, a few of those aircraft are not those you'd expect to see in the role of air sea rescue. Um, for example, I mentioned the Clem KL 35. As seen here on 8mm in 1954 by Kurt Falkenglin, a member of the Nordwest Descanis Flugglub, the Clem KL 35D was actually the version designed as a Luftwaffe trainer model of this incredibly popular sport aircraft. Now, she was mostly used to drop supplies to those in need, uh, scout out those needing rescue, perform liaison duties for the units, and perform administrative roles, as well as returning air crew to their units. Now, it's one of those little Things, the connector between being rescued and going back into action that you know people might not think of otherwise, but it is important to get you back into action as quickly as possible. So a lot of these light aircraft were tasked with that kind of duty. Or bring you to an inland hospital, of course. Uh, but not in this case, it's a, it's a tiny one. But that does bring us to another unexpected article in the inventory, and that's the one that filled the same kind of role in the units was the uh, famous uh, Fiesler Storch. Though never outfitted with floats, to the best of my knowledge, the Storch was also used in liaison and cirque roles. Personally, I wondered when I was researching this if it could have been used as a float plane given the need to overcome the resistance of the water during takeoff and its famously light construction as seen here in a 1938 demonstration in New Jersey. I could kind of imagine the wings being sheared off easily, or just the whole thing falling apart. Either way, she was a valuable air ambulance and liaison aircraft to rescue units who knew that time was not an asset they boasted in abundance where lives were concerned. Now, another aircraft that I mentioned were the captured uh, Blague 521s. Five of them were captured and deployed to the 1st Zenostafos detachment at Odin, and one of these would end up remaining after the retreat, uh, only to serve again in French colors. The other four would retreat to Germany with the rest of the unit. And they served with some distinction over both the uh, Mer Sadique and the Gascon Gol. So it was a powerful trimotor sesquiplane with uh, 900 horsepower Nombron 14 Kiazol engines, five defensive machine guns. Uh, she was an excellent long range reconnaissance aircraft, although limited in her patrol bomber capabilities, since her ordnance limitation was only 465 pound bombs. Interestingly, she had her origins in the short Calcutta, which was manufactured by Breguet under the license as the Breguet SH-2 Calcutta. Sorry, despite the name's pun, the interesting part is not in the aft quarters. The odd structure there in the bow was designed to allow the observers and the crew of A to have the best possible vantage point. It was actually preferred by crewmen who felt limited by the constraints of a turret or blister. Only 37 were built following her maiden flight in 1933, but they weren't built in 1933. They were built in a series of contracts from 1934 to 1939. 
somewhat typical of the time, as I went over in my Flight to Nowhere video on the French interwar aviation debacles. But despite her age and slow 150 mile an hour speed, she was sturdy, seaworthy. She was even well defended for her size and era. And she had an incredible range of 1,300 miles that could be extended to almost 2,000 when using optimal fuel settings. She could even fly in only two motors, or cruise with her central motor if she had to. But of course, that's only in an emergency, and even then, she could repair at sea. Uh, every crew had engineers that were trained to do so. Now, her bottom wing was larger than most, and she was in fact described by the Ejo Naval as biplane. But it also allowed her crews to take full advantage of the lift and glide potential offered by her plane construction in these long-distance flights. But now what really makes her interesting is that she kind of provides a view of the risks of serving in the Seinodienst, specifically uh, the one with the Kennungsmacha SG uh, Cross FM. On 16 November 1940, she took off from Ortem in search of a crew of a downed Heinkel 111 from the pathfinding Kampfgruppe 100. Uh, they had flown out of Van Mucon in Bretagne, and after the pilot of the stricken aircraft uh, reported being dished in the Celtic Sea, the uh, brigade took over. So now the brigade uh, began her patrol. She was intercepted and shot down by a coastal command Blenheim of number 236 squadron flying out of RAF Thorny Island. Despite her markings, her distance from the scrum of the combat zone, uh, she was shot down with all hands lost. It was likely in conjunction with that day's strikes by coastal command against Luftwaffe assets in northern France and it was unfortunately not a rare event for the men sent out on these rescue missions. Uh, it's just one of those little things that, in the course of the war, they saw this aircraft, they noted that it was a rescue aircraft, and they still took her down. So it's uh, not to say that any other country didn't do likewise. I'm sure it was done in every theater. But being assigned to the Seinotdienst was not an easy career move, to say the least. Now, also equipped with the Reg A521, uh, Dornier 24, Heinkel 59, and Heinkel 60 was Zeno Staffel 2. Furthermore, she also had the DO-18, and this unit was established on the 26th of August, 1939. Can't imagine why. You know, was something going to happen in September? Anyway, she was first stationed at uh, Pilau on the Baltic coast until preparations for Operation Selova moved them to Cherbourg in June 1940, where they remained until December 1942. It was at Cherbourg where Staffel II saw the brunt of the Battle of Britain's rescue operations over the Channel, as well as in the North Sea. But even after December 1942, when the Staffel was moved to Askeringwürde in Amsterdam, the units still saw extensive service in the North Sea, where aircraft crews as well as S-boat and the torpedo boat crews, meaning the, the larger torpedo boats, uh, found themselves in peril on the sea. and. You know, this was not an easy undertaking. If you've ever been near the North Sea, she's not. She's not an easy mistress. So as the Kriegsmarine and Luftwaffe were pushed back from any operations at sea following the Normandy invasions, the unit found herself moved to uh, Klosenbrode in uh, July 1944. And then she continued operations there until being disestablished in October 1944. Another veteran of the Battle of Britain would definitely be Seno Staffel III. Now, she was established in June 1940, really right in the middle of the fray. Um, first uh, stationed at Boulon on the Côte d'Opale. Uh, it was there that the unit served until June of 1942 with an inventory that included the... And I know we're getting a little partridge in a pear tree here. So, but uh, again, the Breguet 521 Vizel. Dornier 18, Dornier 24, Heinkel 59, Heinkel 60, as well as the Falkovev 58 Vaiha, or Harrier, and the Junkers uh, Bay 34. So, again, these are aircraft you don't really think of in a maritime role, but the Falkovev uh, FW58 was generally a liaison, recon, air ambulance, transitional trainer, and scout plane. Uh, but she also did serve at sea. The 58W was the model outfitted with twin floats. And she was a 1935 design that served not only with the Luftwaffe, as well as in German civil livery. She also served in foreign service with the Spanish, the Turks, the Hungarians, who produced under license. 
And even the Austrian pre anschluss Luftschleifkräfte, where it served in a bomber role with the Erste Bomberstaffel, she was slow. Uh, she was powered by only two Argus AS-10Cs inverted V8s, uh, rated at 240 horsepower each. Her short range was really nothing worth boasting either. However, she was just the right size. She was familiar to nearly every pilot qualified for multi-engine aircraft. She was adaptable to a multitude of roles and conditions. She was rugged, dependable. She was an unusual choice for the job of air-sea rescue, but she was an appropriate choice. Um, and, you know, the Junkers W-34 would be another one that was familiar to many people, but not those who would have trained in since the foundation of the Luftwaffe as pilots. And you'll see what I mean in a second. This 1926 five-passenger single-motor, single-pilot aircraft was midstream between the W-22 and the U-46 designs by Junkers. And she actually held the world altitude record for a time when she was first in production. Outfitted like a typical Junkers design at the time, including the corrugated skin, the Luftwaffe contracted Junkers for over 2,000 of her. They used them for training navigators and wireless operators, however, rather than pilots. Now, side note, the Colombians and Bolivians used them as bombers in their wars against Peru and Paraguay, respectively, but they weren't really a combat aircraft in any other context. Uh, she was overwhelmingly a transport liaison air ambulance. Now, while the preserved W-34F is noted in many texts, and I've seen this in German, English, and French language publications, as being an experimental version with floats, it was clearly not the only example with floats. The Swedes famously used her as an air ambulance on skis, floats, uh, with the usual landing gear as Luftwaffe did, and there were plenty of them that were outfitted uh, accordingly. So in this context, she was an affordable, rugged air ambulance and air-sea rescue aircraft, particularly in harsh climates. Um, but she also saw service in training units, which is a topic that we're getting to in a little bit. Um, Xander Staffel 6 we go to now, and she's another example of making the best of what was at hand. She was formed in March 1941 in Syracuse in Sicily. In August 1943, a month after the armistice, they moved to Portofino, which is just outside Genova. Here they remained for less than a month until moving to Venice and operating in the Adriatic until August 44, when she was disbanded and her resources distributed to other units. Now, appropriate to her surroundings, the unit's inventory included not only German aircraft like the Blomenvoss 138, Dornier 17 and 24, Falkovol 58, and Heinkel 59, they also used a handful of Italian Kant Z506 Eron floatplane. These famous trimotors were the perfect seaplane for the Mediterranean, just as the Heinkel 115 could be said to be the perfect seaplane for the North Sea. The record setting Eron Air, Heron, uh, as seen here in a post-war demonstration of her rescue capabilities, could be outfitted with torpedoes, bombs, or rescue equipment, just like the 115. She boasted a more spacious interior than most aircraft, and that portrayed, of course, her civil origins as a male and transport aircraft for Alla Ledoria. She wasn't particularly a performance-driven aircraft. Her three Alfa Romeo 126RC349 cylinder air-cooled radials offered only 750 horsepower, um, which produced a top speed of 225 miles an hour. So even though they had the power, it was not efficiently used, put it that way. Uh, her optimal cruising speed was 185 miles an hour. Her biggest performance advantage here, though, is the operational range. She could fly from Ravenna to Alexandria in one go, or she could fly a patrol pattern nearly as large as continental Italy herself. She was elegant, practical, efficient, adaptable, sturdy. She just wasn't fast, that's all. Lightly defended by three rifle caliber machine guns, as well as a single 50 ca or 12.7 millimeter machine gun in a dorsal turret, she also carried a single torpedo when so armed, or nearly twice that in other ordnance, for a total of 2,600 pounds of bombs, depth charges, mines, or what have you. And about 40 examples were used by the RSI and the Luftwaffe after the uh, Kingdom of Italy became a co-belligerent against Germany and the other Axis nations. Before that, the Luftwaffe was already using a handful in air-sea rescue, which is, after all, what we're concerned with here. And the model that was most used by the Seinotdienst was the Z506S Socorso, which literally means succor or assistance. She was fitted specifically for this duty, uh, painted accordingly, yet she was still a target of Allied fighters from time to time. 
That being said, her spacious interior, which was originally designed for 12 to 14 passengers, comfortable passengers, could readily accommodate those needing to be plucked from the sea as well as litters uh, and their attendants. Moving from the Med to the Black Sea, the Luftwaffe could also be seen getting her feet wet. Uh, Sailor Shuffle 8 flew out of uh, Mamaya near Constanza before moving to the uh, Chersonas Cape outside of Sevastopol and then in Sevastopol proper until March 44. She would retreat again to Mamaya in uh, March 44 and then finally end her final weeks of existence in Saloniki and then moving to Athens just to demob. Uh, that was in August and September of 44. So her inventory was fairly standard. Uh, AR-196, DO-24, Fokkeblad 58, Heinkel 59, and 114, and Junkers W-34. But definitely shows that they were, even in areas where overwater operations were not uh, predominant, there was still a need seen to rescue those at sea. In a much more dangerous area, we turn to the Arctic Circle. And up there we see Zeynoshtaf the same. Now they were based in Tromsø from their founding in August 1942 until their redesignation as Zeynoshtaf 50 on uh, 19th of August 1940. Uh, they subsequently then moved to Oslo where they spent the remainder of the war until the surrender in May 45. They were outfitted with the kind of standard uh, you know, melange of uh, Arado 196, 199, Dornier 24, Fakovol 58, Heinkel 59, Heinkel 60, and AG 115. Yeah. So there were, these aren't the only Zenostaffen. Uh, there's a total of 17, uh, as well as the, as I mentioned, the Zenotlotilin. But these I chose really just to kind of give an idea of what operations were like for them. Now, of course, aircraft are nothing without those to fly them. And to learn how to fly, the Luftwaffe had established the Flugzeugführerschule specifically for those who want to see duty over the waves. Now these three, which numbered sequentially, which is nice for a change, operated until 1940. The Erste Flugzeugführer See was founded in Warnemunde in 1935, moved to uh, Ludwigslust and then Neukallen in 39, and finally settled in Parov in 1940. The Zweite Flugzeugführer See was founded a year later, in April 36, at Flutznitz. Uh, after the last few months of 39 and into the early months of 40, they moved inland a few miles uh, to uh, nearby cities in uh, Klinvidigushaven, Aulno, and Basendorf, operating uh, on lakes and rivers, of course. And then the uh, third Flugzeugführerschule, uh, also founded in April 36, was founded in Stethen, and she operated there until uh, December of 1940. Now, in December of 1940, the units were absorbed into other schools. Uh, the Erste Flugzeugführerschule Z folded into the Flugzeugführerschule A, B, C. A and B meaning your uh, first two stages of training, your, your basic and your primary. Um, and the second uh, Flugzeugführerschule Z was redesignated as Flugzeugführerschule C17. Uh, so that was a more advanced unit, although certain sections were absorbed into uh, the school AB-119. The third Flugzeugführerschule Z was absorbed by Flugzeugführerschule AB-118. So they, they really just didn't see a need to invest in training maritime pilots specifically from uh, primary and basic all the way through to advanced. Now that doesn't mean that they stopped preparing men for service over the waves. The other schools, uh, especially bombing and torpedo bombing, were active. These three Fliegerwaffenschules lasted longer than the pilot schools, but they also changed over time. Remember I talked about German torpedoes not exactly being the best in the world. They had to adapt. So founded in October 1935, October 1936, and November 1939, respectively, the Erste Fliegerwaffenschule Z operated from Paro uh, with these three Staffen until it was transformed into the conglomerate training training unit, uh, Kampfliegerschule 5. Still operated out of uh, Powell and included some staff Geschwader from the pilot schools. Now in turn, 
Tom Dicker Schule from Spate in uh, March 1943 shows the changing tides of war as the bombing training school is redesignated Kampfbeerbach der Schule for the Combat Observer School. This switch to patrol bombing and recon and away from offensive operations at sea shows how Allied control of both the Atlantic and Mediterranean affected training. On the 10th of June 1944, Kampfbeerbach der Schule 4 was finally disbanded. Uh, just as the Allied invasion of France cemented the position of German air power at sea in all practical terms. Uh, the second uh, Fliegerwaffenschule operated until December of 1940 out of the adjacent locale of uh, Burg auf Rügen. She was redesignated the Bombenschützenschule Burg and was assigned to train air gunners uh, during the time of redesignation. And finally, the third uh, Fliegerwaffenschule operated out of Dievanov during its short life. She was only operational from November 1939 to April 1940. She was then incorporated into the School for Maritime Signals personnel, the Luftnachrichtenschule Zs. So while many of the aircraft in which these men trained were the same primary and basic trainers used by all pilot schools, their advanced training included a wide variety of aircraft. Standard seaplanes and float planes, uh, later on U-88s, Heinkel 111s, and even Italian uh, Savoy Marchetti SM-79 Sparvieros and captured gladiators were even used. However, many pilots trained in machines which were tremendously obsolete, uh, which is not unusual for trainers. Uh, and this shows a great deal about the lack of importance placed on seafaring pilots and crew, since it wasn't just their basic flight that occurred in obsolete aircraft, but even their advanced training sometimes. However, it's also a testament to the adaptability and the determination of these pilots and aircrew, who certainly can be said to have flown some of the most dangerous missions of the war. Uh, the uh, Klemp KL-35, Junkers W-34, the Heinkel-115, we already looked at those. So I'm just going to take a brief look at some of the ones you may not recognize. Uh, the Arado 65 is well known if you're one of my fellow fans of the interwar years. She was a single-seat fighter aircraft developed in the Weimar years, actually. Uh, she served briefly in the Reichswehr with the Fliegergruppe Döberitz and Fliegergruppe Damm from 1933 to 1935. She quickly became a training aircraft of dubious utility. However, she was stable and a useful advanced trainer for pilots who were new to solo flying. Now, next up, we have the uh, one of the more famous aircraft, the Falkenwolf FW-44 Stieglitz, but not Stieglitz. Thank you, Colonel Asayev. Bye-bye. Okay. The uh, Stieglitz, or Goldfinch, was a standard basic trainer and acrobatic aircraft, but what makes it unique is that it was the aircraft that really made Falke uh, Designed in 1931 by Kurt Tank, thousands were produced. It was a popular civil aircraft both before the war and long after the war was over. Uh, there are plenty of videos you can find that show the capabilities of this classic aircraft, so I'm not going to bore you here. Instead, I'm going to move on to the Gotha Geo 145. She's also another famous two-seat trainer and acrobatic aircraft. Small, agile, sturdy. Uh, she was about as far a cry from the heavy bombers that once emerged from Gotha's factories to terrorize London. What is interesting to note, and I found this when I was looking at it, is that I didn't realize she was used as the test bed for the uh, Argus Pulse jet. So, <laughs> one of those things you wouldn't really think of, but not much really else interesting about her as far as this is concerned. Uh, an aircraft that is much more interesting is this one. While the Luftwaffe's use of captured equipment is well known, Norwegian aircraft are not the first thing to pop into one's mind. The Marinens Flüver Badfabrik MF Eliva was also known as the uh, Höver MF 11 after the designer. Uh, they were captured after the Norwegian campaign and used for training. Now, she's a little known aircraft, <laughs> right up my alley. But uh, some examples of this two seat flow plane were actually used by Flugzeugführer Schulze 1 while stationed in Vanemunde, quite far from occupied Norway, which makes me feel it's even more one of the more awkward choices for a training aircraft, but one of those interesting finds than in, you know, what you see in what is otherwise a mundane setting. And that brings us to the advanced training and the supplementary units. The, uh, that is what Ergänzungsgruppe literally means, is the supplementary group or the kind of the poolies waiting to go forward. And what's interesting is that the role of the Luftwaffe at sea is reflected in composition. These units began as a mix of flying boats, land-based bombers, and float planes. 
uh, flying boats ended up serving in Copenhagen for most of the war. And, you know, the origins of this unit were in the pre-war 26 replacement detachment. On the 1st of April 1939, they were redesignated the 26th Flight Train Battalion. Finally, on 27th of January 1940, they incorporated into the remaining elements of maritime training units, and they became known as the uh, Figa against Gruppe Z. So, staff from the parent unit and other maritime elements fleshed out the first two Staffens, and the third Staffen was formed from instructors pulled out of uh, Spinamunda. So, the four different Staffen of the Figa against Gruppe Z changed over time, but each was designed for a specific purpose. The first Staffel was meant for flying boat and float plane operations and was originally outfitted with uh, Dornier 18s and Heinkel 115s. Later on, she would get the uh, Blomenfoss 138. Now, they were first based at Pilau until they moved to uh, Copenhagen in the 5th of June 1941, and they were there up until the time they were stood down in September 1944. The second Staffel was outfitted with the Dornier 17s and Heinkel 111s. Uh, so as to train land-based bomber crews in maritime operations, uh, as well as uh, with the Heinkel 111, they have torpedoes there. Now, the third Staffel is a bit confusing. She was originally made to train for shipboard operations and was outfitted with the Rado 196 and Heinkel 114. Uh, she was based in Tisted and occupied Denmark with some operations out of Aalborg. But they moved in May of 1941 to Kamp, where they were uh, renumbered as the 4th Staffel in February 1941, and then were detached uh, to Kampfgruppe 506 in September 1941, and they remained there until September 44. At that time, they were ordered to Putznitz in Vorpommern. Uh, today, it's uh, Ribnitz Damgarten in Mecklenburg Vorpommern, uh, before being disbanded only days later on the 3rd of October 1944. Now, the new Third Staffel, which was established on uh, 25th of June, only two months after the transfer of the old Third Staffel, was, like the second Staffel, outfitted to train men for land-based aircraft assigned to maritime operations. This time it would be outfitted with the Younger's U-88. Uh, they trained men to take advantage of a craft which excelled at sea in dive and torpedo bomber roles, and yeah, they were definitely a specialized training unit in that regard. Now, in September of 1944, the final changes would manifest as the first Staffel became the uh, Ergänzungskustenfliegerstaffel, and the second and fourth Staffel were combined into the Ergänzungskustenahaftungs and Bordfliegerstaffel, a unit which probably holds the record for a lengthy German term that is even lengthier in English, but the Supplemental Coastal Proximal Reconnaissance and Shipboard Flying Personnel Unit. One thing I like about German, you can take a lot of little words and make big words, but at least they make sense. So with that, we look at what you'd expect to be a maritime unit, but wasn't. And I, I just think it's useful to maritime endeavors, so it's worth noting them here. And these are the Wetterkundungsstaffen, um, meteorological units. They made no use of float planes or flying boats, um, despite the fact that, you know, craft like the BV-138 or anything like that would have been very useful, especially, you know, when you're doing long-distance uh, flights or carrying heavy supplies. Instead, U-86s, U-88s, U-52s, Heinkel 111s, and BF-110s were used. Uh, the U-86, of course, was a valuable part of the war effort once it was adapted for high-altitude flight uh, and long distance, of course. That's uh, probably one of the more overlooked Luftwaffe aircraft. And later in the war, the Junkers 188 would also join. And their duties also included weather stations, both automated and manned, and their duties took them as far out as uh, Newfoundland, Greenland, Svalbard, um, and places elsewhere, thanks to the Luftwaffe and the U-Bordwaffe's uh, cunning at, at putting these things in places where the Allies hopefully wouldn't find them. And as I said, unfortunately, Luftwaffe never saw the use in using seaplanes and flying boats for these duties, which separates them from most other nations. Now, there were a dozen Veteral Kundungstaffen over the course of the war, and each had specific area of responsibilities. Assigned to the 1st through 5th Luftflotte, as well as some details specifically to Göring's command, each had a selection of aircraft at their disposal. However, not a single Vekusta, as they were abbreviated, 
was ever assigned to the Kriegsmarine's needs or even tasked with inter-service liaison duties. Instead, the Kriegsmarine had an entirely separate network of weather ships at their disposal, in addition to the information from both automated and manned weather stations. So, on a closing note here, if it's the frog theme that makes you laugh when looking at these, this is a play on words that to uh, people who don't know German might be a little confusing. The German nickname for a meteorologist is a weather frog, ein Wetterfrosch. Uh, weather girls in Germany are Wetterfe, I believe, weather fairies. I might be wrong, but uh, either way, the weather frog is kind of a nickname for you know your weatherman. And it was after the penchant for tree frogs to ascend their arboreal homes during sunny weather and retreat to the ground in poor weather. So uh, nothing mythological or anything there, just kind of a everyday joke. So with that, we finish up the second part of episode three. Um, I know that unit organization and things like that isn't always everyone's cup of tea, but I find it interesting. I think it's necessary to really explain what the Luftwaffe was doing once the war broke out. And it definitely sets us up for the next episodes. And I think that I know my fans like the nitty gritty nerdy stuff, being a nitty gritty nerd myself. So coming up next is episode four, A New Hope. No, it isn't. It's Holding Patterns. Episode four, Holding Patterns. And episode five, Denouement. Uh, these cover about 19... Late 43 into 44, and then finally 1945, as the war grinds down, but new designs keep popping up for the Luftwaffe at sea. Now, before I go, I can't finish without thanking my patrons. Uh, YouTube channel memberships start at a dollar a month, uh, Patreon starts at three dollars a month. With having my most popular videos demonetized and all that good stuff, your donations and merch purchases at the store are really what keeps it going and helping to cover my software subscriptions and the other costs of production. Um, also, a lot of my most popular videos have been demonetized due to a copyright strike from, uh, in one case, it was a uh, Polish radio station that claimed uh, and won somehow a copyright over footage of Scapa Flow scuttlings in 1919. My uh, Fairy Wings video and uh, most of my most popular videos basically are going to an alleged copyright holder. So please do consider becoming a channel member or a Patreon patron uh, if you enjoy these videos. But most importantly, however, share. Uh, the more word gets out there, the more views, the more the algorithm likes me again. The YouTubes are a fickle mistress. And until next time, I'm Claire, and I am the Warbird Mistress. Take care.